Good morning, everyone. So we're currently experiencing a large resurgence in COVID-19 cases in our community and in many communities across the United States. And this resurgence is due to the new version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, called the Delta variant. And I know that many people have questions about Delta variant, why it's different, why we're seeing this surge in cases now particularly across areas of the South and the Midwest where vaccination rates uh, are lower than they are in other parts of the country. So we have some graphics that our team here at IXL in, um, uh, in partnership with uh, Dr. Peter Angeletti's team uh, at UNL have developed to help us demonstrate the, the Delta variant, how it invades and impacts uh, human respiratory epithelial cells and why Delta variant is more severe uh, and is causing more serious outbreaks than we've seen uh, in previous waves of the pandemic. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a, a quick look at, at Delta variant uh, and what's different about this virus. So this is a representation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's the virus that causes COVID-19 one of the most important features of the virus are these proteins here that stick out from the, the cell surface. Those are spike proteins. They're actually what give the virus its appearance uh, that make it look like a crown under electron microscopy. It's why it's called coronavirus. But the other important thing about these spike proteins is it's how the virus attaches itself to our cells and allows it to gain entry. And what we've seen with Delta variant is there's some changes in the spike protein that allow the virus to bind more tightly to its cell receptor and to gain entry into cells more readily. And we're gonna get, look at a video now that demonstrates that. <clears throat> so this video shows us a human respiratory epithelial cell. These are the cells that line your airways and inside your lungs. And this is one of the primary targets for coronaviruses and the Delta variant. And here we see the Delta variant virus binding to its cell receptor, which is the ACE2 receptor on the outside of the cells. And that's how it gains entry inside the cell. Once it's in the cell, it releases its RNA genetic code uh, and that genetic code is then turned into proteins by the cell. Those viral proteins uh, are then able to go inside um, kind of the, the manufacturing area of the cell. This is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And what the virus does is it now hijacks the cell and turns it into a virus factory. So now the cell is just making virus proteins and RNA. Those get packaged into a new virus that then moves through what's called the Golgi apparatus to get enveloped. And then it comes out of the, the cell surface and goes on to infect other cells in the body and also to infect other people. Those are the viruses that we shed out of our nose and, and our respiratory epithelium that make it infectious. And what we know about the Delta variant is again, it does a much better job of binding to the cell surface receptor and gaining entry. It also does a better job of turning your cells into that virus factory. So it produces many more progeny, many more daughter virus uh, particles than previous versions of the coronavirus. And we know that people with Delta variant can shed uh, up to a thousand times or more the amount of virus from their nose and respiratory epithelium than with the previous virus. Again, this is taking us through the process one more time. Remember the, the virus uh, RNA gets turned into proteins which then hijack the cell. And now the cell is just making new viruses. Those new virus particles get packaged together. They come through the Golgi apparatus, uh, they get enveloped and then they are extruded outside of the cell going on to infect uh, other cells. Now I think if we move forward, we can look at how vaccines protect us. So if we stop here, well, let's go back a little bit if we can or start again. No worries. <clears throat> All right, keep going just a, just a second. Stop right there. Perfect. So this is the receptor uh, on the cell that the virus binds to. That's the ACE2 receptor. And again, this is the spike protein. And that spike protein and the ACE2 receptor work like a, a key and a lock, right? They fit very tightly together. And the better the fit, the more uh, the virus is able to gain entry, the tighter that bond. And we know, again, 
Delta variant gives you a very tight fit, a much tighter fit uh, with that ACE2 receptor. Now, a way to prevent the virus from gaining entry are these things, which are antibodies, right? So those antibodies also target that spike protein, and they bind to the spike protein and block its ability uh, to be able to bind to the cell receptor. So when that lock and key can't fit together, the virus can invade your cell, and it's taken away and killed and disposed of by the immune system. And these antibodies are what are produced when you get vaccinated, right? The vaccines produce very high levels of neutralizing antibodies, uh, much higher than the levels of antibodies you get with natural infection. And that's the reason, at least one of the main reasons, we think, why vaccines for COVID-19 work so much better than protection from previous infection. You get much higher titers of antibodies with two doses of uh, the vaccines. And when you have these high titers of antibodies, again, you block the spike protein's ability to bind to its cell receptor. It can't get into your cells. It can't hijack them to make more viruses. And again, it's taken away and killed by the immune system. And that's why it's so important that we get as many of our community vaccinated as possible so we can avoid that scenario of the virus infecting a cell and we can get to this scenario where everybody has antibodies that prevents that cell invasion and replication of the virus. So I think that's what we have for the, the graphics. And again, I think it's really helpful to kind of be able to visualize what's going on at a cellular level. I think we have an even uh, more close up version of the virus invasion uh, and what happens when it gets inside the cell that we can play here. But I'm happy to take any questions now. Yes. Um, so they always are saying that the Delta variant is more transmissible and obviously more contagious. Is there anything else that it does particularly to the human body that like the other um, versions of COVID-19 um, haven't done that you've noticed that's like strikingly different? Right. Great question. So it, it, again, uh, you're correct. It, it does appear that the virus is much more transmissible, probably twice as transmissible from person to person as the original virus was, and people shed much more virus from their respiratory epithelium, one of the reasons why it is much more transmissible. The other thing that, that seems to be more and more clear is it's able to cause more severe disease uh, in an individual compared to uh, previous versions of the virus. So if you look at some of the studies that have come out of Canada and Europe, um, the Delta variant seems to cause around two times uh, or even two to three times the rate of hospitalization, the rate of ICU admission for a given person compared to older versions of the virus. And so uh, it not only spreads more easily, it causes more severe disease. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we're seeing so many more ICU admissions uh, from this current wave of Delta variant than we would necessarily suspect, right? Infections are primarily occurring uh, in unvaccinated individuals, particularly serious infections that are requiring hospitalizations. And previously, uh, we didn't see as many hospitalizations in people in their 30s and 40s and even 50s, um, but now we're seeing that quite commonly. And, and so that, I think, is very good evidence that the Delta variant is able to actually cause more severe disease in people than previous variants. That's a great question. We don't have a lot of data on infections of the fetus in pregnancy. We do have more and more data now, however, that show pregnant women are especially vulnerable to Delta variant infection. And we're seeing many more hospitalizations among pregnant women uh, compared to previous versions of the virus. We also know from uh, studies that have been done now on tens of thousands of pregnant women in clinical trials, and in addition, millions of vaccinations, obviously, that have been given across the US, that these vaccines are safe in pregnancy. They don't affect, um, they don't affect fetal development. They don't affect uh, childbirth. They don't affect fertility. Uh, so the vaccines have a very good safety profile and it's very important for pregnant women to get vaccinated because their rate of complications from infection with COVID-19 are much greater than non-pregnant women. Yes. Have you encountered any misconceptions about the vaccine and the Delta variant specifically that you want to dispel? 
Well, I'm not sure that there are specific misconceptions uh, about the Delta variant, but, but obviously a, a lot of misinformation and mis misconceptions out there around the vaccine, one of which I, I just pointed out that people have um, really attached to the rumor that there are fertility issues associated with the vaccine, and, th and that's simply not been demonstrated in any of the data we have. Uh, there's also no evidence that there are long-term effects from the vaccine. Again, uh, we, we don't um, routinely see long-term effects from vaccines that would manifest themselves after uh, several weeks uh, after vaccination and so have no reason to believe that we would have long-term effects from these vaccines. The safety profile of these vaccines is very much in line with all, all of the other routine vaccinations that we typically use. Um, and again, we've had now hundreds of millions of doses, over 300 million doses of these vaccines given to Americans and billions of doses given to people worldwide. Uh, and uh, there has been no vaccine ever, I, I think, that has had the uh, safety profiling and monitoring that these vaccines have had prior to full licensure. And so I, I have extreme confidence in the safety of these vaccines and certainly the, the efficacy data of these vaccines is quite clear. Uh, we are seeing primarily unvaccinated people in uh, being hospitalized now with Delta variant and uh, the rate of hospitalization for people who are fully vaccinated is, is still low. Uh, certainly breakthrough infections are more common with Delta, and we know that the vaccines aren't perfect, none are, but we're seeing uh, a dramatic reduction in severe infections and hospitalizations in people who are fully vaccinated. Yes? I know that there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to the vaccines, but obviously as we learn more about the Delta variant, possibly other variants, how much do you expect that we will have to tweak vaccines or future other Medicaid or anything else that we have to do to prevent our bodies to fight it? That's a great question. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of questions that, that experts and scientists have about how long will immunity last? When will we really need people to get boosters? Will those boosters need to be different? Will we need to modify the vaccine to reflect some of the newer variants? Right now, I don't think we have the answers to those questions yet. Uh, what is clear is that the longer we allow the pandemic to go on, uh, and uh, this is not just a, a problem here in the U.S., this is globally, right? The more people that are infected with uh, new variants of the virus, the more we have partially immune, partially vaccinated populations out there with the virus circulating, the more opportunities we give for new variants to arise that may eventually be able to do a better job at escaping uh, the protection from the vaccines. Uh, we hope that we can vaccinate enough of the world's population so we prevent that from happening. Uh, and then we just have to worry about periodic booster vaccines for people going forward. I, I think it's true that eventually most of us will need a booster shot. Um, right now, we're not seeing evidence that indicates that there's an emergency that we need boosters right now. And from a, from a global perspective, we're all better off and we're all better protected if we vaccinate a larger proportion of the world's population so we can suppress global transmission of the virus rather than focusing on what might be incremental improvements in individual protection with a booster right now. Yes. Is there any indication that this hits harder on children? There's been a lot of discussion about that. Well, I, I think it's... Do we know yet? I, I don't know that we have definitive answers on that, but certainly anecdotally we're seeing many more pediatric admissions uh, for COVID-19 than we have in previous waves. I think it's also important to remember that we are seeing at the same time rising rates of RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza virus infections, and even early influenza infections in children, which this is an unusual time in the middle of summer to see many of those respiratory viruses. And this is probably an effect of um, the face masks kind of being removed and a lot of the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we were taking that were suppressing all of these respiratory viruses, not just COVID-19. I think now that those protections have been lifted, we're seeing a resurgence in all of these different respiratory viruses. So we're seeing not only a surge in COVID-19 cases in kids, but I think a combination of all of these other viruses, which for the very young infants and children who have underlying uh, comorbidities, these infections can be very serious, RSV and parainfluenza. And so uh, all of these, I think, are going to be eating into our uh, pediatric critical care resources, which are obviously pretty limited to begin with. And so I'm very worried about what's going to happen with 
uh, pediatric hospital capacity over the coming weeks. Do you think that members of the community should, at this point, be kind of scared of what's happening? I think people should be very concerned about the trends we're seeing. Um, I think many of us were hopeful several weeks ago that our course of the Delta wave would be more similar to the UK. Right, so in England and the UK, they've seen a pretty dramatic spike in cases, but their hospitalization rates did not go up at near the same proportion as they had with previous waves. What we're seeing currently in places like Florida and Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, um, Mississippi, everywhere in the US that we're seeing Delta wave uh, growth, we're seeing hospitalization and ICU admission rates that are going up uh, at the same rate or even higher than they were back in the fall. And that's a really dire warning sign that we're not going to have the same experience that the UK did. We're seeing hospitals already overwhelmed uh, in places, uh, in parts of Florida and parts of Texas and Louisiana. And unfortunately, I think that trend's going to continue. So I'm, I'm concerned this is going to be the worst phase of the pandemic for much of the US, particularly states like ours that have low vaccination rates. How far behind those states are weak. Is there weeks, months before? So we're probably a, a month, three to four weeks behind many of the states that were the earliest to experience a Delta surge. And so that means that most of those states have not yet peaked by any means. And so we're going to see continued growth for at least the next three to four weeks, if not longer, to be honest. If we follow a time pattern similar to the UK, we may be in for another six weeks of growth. That doesn't account for the fact that we're about to open schools, right? And we know that in the UK, kids and schools drove transmission of the, the Delta wave uh, quite significantly. And so when we open schools, uh, particularly if we open schools without kids with face masks and other non-pharmaceutical interventions, those layers of Swiss cheese that we've talked about and how you block propagation of the virus through a community, we're just going to be throwing gasoline on a fire at that point, and we're going to see much higher rates of transmission. And unfortunately, the way things are going, that translates into increased hospitalizations, increased ICU admissions, and we're going to see increased deaths. And those deaths are not going to be in 85-year-olds anymore. Those deaths are now occurring in 45-year-olds, and, and that's going to be a significant difference. How frustrating is it for you personally to to try to go to all these lengths to get through to people. I mean, we've got this simple breakdown that you have, but everybody's seen the photos of the lungs, the unvaccinated versus vaccinated. I mean, how many more ways can you get through to members of the public? Well, we're gonna keep trying. Uh, we're gonna keep talking about the, the data we have and the facts and, and hope that uh, people can change their behavior and that collectively we can work on reinstituting many of these protections that got us through the the fall and winter wave. I'm actually encouraged somewhat by some of the data that's coming out of states that are experiencing large waves uh, of Delta variant. And even here, we are starting to see more vaccinations happening compared to where we were a couple of weeks ago. If we can build on that momentum and get enough of the community vaccinated, we'll be free of this, right? If we were able to reach high rates of vaccination in the community, 80% of the community vaccinated, we really would have a, a very mild experience with this Delta wave. And I think the UK is a great example of that, right? They have much higher vaccination rates, particularly among kind of young and middle-aged adults. And that's why they're not seeing this explosive growth in hospitalizations. So if we can get there, uh, and we don't have much time, but if we can get there, we can really avert the worst part of this. And, and again, that's been encouraging to see that we're, we are starting to make an impact in vaccination. So hopefully we can continue. Should people, including those who are vaccinated, be changing their habits right now? Yes, absolutely. I think that the CDC was, uh, was right on in um, adjusting their masking guidance. Yeah take issue with whether they should have changed it to begin with several couple of months ago. But at any rate, I think it's clear that um, not only should unvaccinated people be wearing face masks in public indoor spaces, but vaccinated folks as well. And we, we know that we're seeing higher rates of breakthrough infections. We know that vaccinated people are able to transmit to others. It happens at a lower rate than it does with unvaccinated, but it still happens. And so if we want to maximize protection of the community and minimize the number of cases, minimize hospitalizations and deaths, everybody should be wearing face masks indoors in, in public settings. And we should be 
doing a lot of the things that we did back in the, the fall and winter that allowed us to navigate that surge that we experienced. Yes. I know ideally you'd want the vaccination rate of 100%. That's probably living in a perfect world, though. So, but what rate would you say is it ideal that we would be able to achieve that herd immunity? 75%? So it's um, it's a bit of a guesswork, right? But if you look at the epidemiology and, and modeling based on what we think the the reproductive number of this virus is, it, it gets you to a, a herd immunity threshold of around 85% or so. Uh, so ideally, you'd like to have 85% of the, of the entire population vaccinated. And, and obviously, we're still, we don't have vaccines eligible for, um, for children under the age of 12 right now. And so that takes uh, a, a bit of the population off the table. The reality is, in, you know, the real world is a lot messier than that, right? And so transmission generally occurs in smaller pockets of the population. And it's particularly school-aged children, young adults and middle-aged adults, they're the most connected in our society, right? They bump into the most people every day. They're most responsible for virus transmission. So if you can just get vaccination levels up high in that particular population, um, the rest can kind of take care of itself. So I do think that a, a, a legitimate target seems to be at least 70% of the entire population vaccinated. Again, if you look at the UK, that's about where they are. And again, their experience with Delta Wave has been much, much better. Hospitalization rates much lower. I think once you get to 75% or 80%, you really start to see dramatic suppression of transmission. The, the reality is we have a long way to go, right? So the more vaccinations we can get in the community, the better off we'll be. Uh, again, I think once we get to rates, there are states in, in the US that have, that have achieved those rates, that states in the Northeast, particularly Vermont and Maine and um, New Hampshire have pretty high vaccination rates and they're seeing uh, relatively mild waves of, of Delta so far. So uh, we have a long way to go, but I, I think we can get there. And again, if we can get to those rates, um, we'll really navigate this um, relatively smoothly. Is there anything you might have for local school districts who right now are just um, recommending masks and not requiring them of their students, especially the younger ones? Right. Well, I, I know there have been some school districts that have now moved towards uh, at least mandating vaccines in elementary school students who don't have the option to be vaccinated. Again, I, I think the CDC's guidance is pretty straightforward and pretty clear, and the CDC recommends universal masking for all students in a classroom setting. Um, important to remember uh, that respiratory viruses transmit through proximity, contact, and duration, right? So um, <clears throat> particularly in indoor settings uh, where there's less air exchange, there's higher concentration of the virus in the air. There's nowhere in our communities uh, where population density indoors is as high as it is in schools. Nowhere, office buildings, prisons, um, anywhere else uh, doesn't approach the population density that we put kids in for seven hours a day together in a school. So um, it is obvious that schools are one of the highest risk environments for transmission of this virus, particularly of Delta variant. And again, the UK, I think, demonstrated that quite clearly uh, with their recent wave. And so we need to take the, the maximum uh, protections for students. I think it's it's possible to have students and it's a priority to have students in person in school. We all know that that's the best place for kids to be. Uh, but the way to do that safely is to put all of these layered non-pharmaceutical interventions, those layers of Swiss cheese together. Uh, certainly vaccine is the most important tool we have, but many kids aren't eligible to get vaccinated yet. Uh, and other things such as face masks, uh, de-densification, increasing air exchange and ventilation in schools, all of those are gonna be important factors to create a safe school environment. Yes, Julie. So what would you tell a bunch of high school kids who maybe have gone out and gotten the vaccine, even though they don't feel they're high risk, what would you tell them? It's like, okay, now you guys should wear masks too. What yes. Would, what would you uh, say I would recommend highly that even if they're fully vaccinated, which I commend uh, those high school students that have gone out and gotten vaccinated, uh, but would recommend that they continue to wear face masks. Again, because they're going to be in one of the highest risk environments that we can have uh, in a school setting for long periods of time together. And we know that all of these interventions work on a population scale, right? So vaccinations and face masks and distancing, um, 
we, we like to think of them on an individual basis, what's it doing for me? But the reality is that they have their effect on a population scale. And when you apply these in layers across a population, they have a synergistic effect in reducing transmission. So it's important for us to, to work together on all of this and, and to recognize that we're not just wearing face masks to protect ourselves, not even just wearing face masks to protect our family members. We're protecting our friends, our extended family, grandma and grandpa were, ex were protecting the neighbor with, um, uh, who had a kidney transplant, who's on immunosuppressive medicines, who may not have uh, as good a, a, an effectiveness of the vaccine as others, right? We wear masks to protect all of those other people in the community, and they're wearing masks to protect us, and that's how we can collectively defeat this virus. Yes? Right. On the front lines. How, what is their mindset right now? How do you prepare them, or what have you learned from the first wave that could make potentially a second wave more easily navigated? Well, I'm, I'm definitely concerned about our first line responders. I'm concerned about our healthcare workers. I, I've been in awe of my colleagues in the hospital since the beginning of the pandemic, particularly nursing staff and respiratory therapists and all of the techs who've worked uh, just tirelessly uh, in very difficult conditions, uh, both physically and psychologically, having to watch people isolated going through um, uh, the last phases of their lives alone. Uh, and that's taken a huge mental toll on people. And I think for many of our healthcare workers kind of looking now at this looming crisis again, it's pretty overwhelming for them. And so I, I'm worried about the, um, the state of mental health for many of our healthcare workers and how we're going to help them navigate through this next phase. That's gonna be hard. Uh, and so uh, again, I think um, trying to protect our healthcare resources, including our, our people, is a, is a really important part of why we need to take aggressive action now. We're going to see potentially case rates and hospitalization rates uh, similar to what we saw in the fall, but as opposed to what we had in the fall, we have hospitals that are already full, right, with some of these other respiratory virus in, uh, admissions that we've been seeing. And just in general, most of our hospitals have been really busy. We don't have the surge capacity that we had previously. And we have uh, a bunch of nurses and, and doctors who've been dealing with this for 18 months, and, and a lot of them are just, just burned out, right, understandably. So that's gonna be uh, a lot harder for us to deliver good care uh, to all of the people that may be flooding our doors. And we know that when hospitals are overwhelmed, uh, when healthcare workers are, are stressed and overworked and taking care of too many patients, right, when critical care nurses are, are taking care of three or four or five patients instead of one or two, uh, we know that your outcomes get worse, right? That's been shown not just for COVID, for every uh, illness that requires admission. And so we're gonna see worse outcomes in our hospitals if we continue to stress the system. Are you able to show us what a healthy lung looks like and what a infected lung looks like? Yeah, let's see if our magicians from IXL can do that. There we go. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, a 3D uh, rendition of a, a, a CT scan or a CAT scan of what <clears throat> a healthy lung should look like. Um, so this is you know, really a wonder of uh, technology that we can do these 3D reconstructions now based on CT scans. This is a real CT scan of a real patient's lung, by the way. What we have now is a comparison of uh, a CT scan of a patient's lung, uh, a, a patient who recovered from COVID-19, and you can see the extensive amount of damage. Uh, there is scarring and fibrosis and inflammation throughout this lung um, that is going to be, uh, in most cases, in many of these severe um, cases of damaged lung like this, permanent, right? This person is never gonna have normal pulmonary function again. As a matter of fact, we've seen patients here at our hospital, uh, and hospitals across the country have seen patients whose um, 
fibro fibrosis scarring uh, and inflammation in their lungs is so bad, even after they recover from the infection, that they require a lung transplant because their lungs are, are no longer able to oxygenate uh, adequately. And so um, COVID-19 is a severe disease, uh, especially of the lungs and respiratory tract uh, and in even very young people. Uh, so again, these, these are often people in their 40s and 50s and, and even 30s that we're seeing extensive lung damage in. Uh, it can cause long-standing and permanent disability even after you recover. Thanks guys, this was a great graphic. <laughs>